Hello, this is Greg Smalley on Pod 366, a weird movies podcast, joined today as I often am by Giles Edwards. Hello. And uh, today we are planning on doing something a little different. We have a very short slate of films to discuss. And so after we are done, we are going to bring on some contestants and play a little game show where we attempt to guess weird movie posters or stills based purely on vis word pictures painted by Giles Edwards. So, yes. And and uh we're calling it I've come up with a uh a delightfully a uh, clever name for it. Guess that weird movie. So, oh, pretty pretty yeah. clever play. That's uh, that's like double lateral thinking. So you you reach <laughs> around to where you started. That's exactly what it is. But before that, let's discuss the four movie items I have to discuss for this week, and I've put them out of a little out of order that I wanted to discuss them. But let's discuss the biggest release we actually have this week three theatrical releases uh and uh, only one blu-ray release kind of a uh inversion of what normally happens mm -hmm. <clears throat> but uh we have our first one ready to go and giles why don't you get in practice of describing oh, right. movie posters well, by uh, we'll start with the young man in the center i i gotta say from uh from the gate he's got what is known in uh, japanese cinema as some idiot hair going on he's got a sort of mop top thing with a little sprawling bit sticking up in the back and he's looking slightly bewildered not yet uh crushed by whatever news he's enduring and in the backdrop, there's a, a kind of drawing style, bright blue cloudy sky, but inverted coming at us and him from the top, spires of uh, fairly recognizable, famous tall buildings and a statue, all kind of spiraling ever so slightly in a counterclockwise direction toward this... Uh, slightly adult looking young Hispanic gentleman. And uh, he looks like a, a stranger in a strange land kind of thing as the uh, pastel buildings loom quirkily and menacingly above him. And so if we were playing the game, I would go, uh, I would bring in and go, problemista. Good, good, good guess, Greg. That's exactly what this ah, is. Right. Is a new motion picture with uh, some names that are of interest to us. Yeah. Um, Problemista from A24, written and directed by Julio Torres, uh, who's a newcomer. And the stars, the main star of interest is probably uh, Tilda Swinton and uh, narrated by Isabella Rossellini. Oh, okay. And uh, there's also uh, RZA, uh, Rapper, and Greta Lee, a recent Oscar nominee, yeah. are in it in smaller parts. Uh, this one has been, they, they've uh, been showing the trailer for this one for quite a while in theaters, uh, trying to drum up interest in it. And um, I have to be honest, to, to me... The trailer didn't look that weird. However, mm -hmm. I'm going off what the um, the description of their their log line, official log line is uh, with Problemista, Julio Torres's utter, utterly unique sensibilities prove awesome. a perfectly cracked lens through which to find the surreal humor in bleak aspects of human experience. Uh, so they dropped the surreal word. And then... From the critics who have seen it, there's one who compares it to Terry Gilliam. There's one who says Christopher Lloyd of the film The App says, weirdness for weirdness sakes just kind of works in this trippy, funny, downbeat meditation. A number of people uh, 
have described it. Matt Rodriguez of something called Shake Fire describes it as bizarre. Uh, so a lot of people have who have actually seen it claim that it is indeed weird from their perspective. I imagine this will fall very squarely into quirky for us with our zero to be gotten frame of reference. That was my guess from watching the trailer. I assume you watched the trailer. I did actually this time because I thought Greg sent me some links <laughs> and he often asked me about the trailer. This time I'm going to do it. And I did it. And yeah, it definitely feels like, uh, um, yeah, Gilliam, I think would be the first, like if, if Gilliam were tasked with making a kind of breezy immigration comedy drama, dramedy, this definitely has yeah, it's, it's, uh, definitely uh, some of the visuals smacked of science of sleep. Yeah, you know, it has a lot of you know uh, color schemes smack of uh, Wes Anderson. Definitely, you know, a, a movie I suspect of its time, and uh, showing the influences that I think are all great influences to have proudly on display for this um, little what's it. So yeah, my guess is the strangest thing about this will probably be whatever Tilda Swinton gets up to as the borderline outsider artist yeah um it, it just seemed like it was a movie maybe amelie is a good oh yeah yeah that reference kinda... for it, where it has these fantasy sequences but they all seem to be very on the nose and describing exactly what's going on in the movie for example they're in an immigration uh office and people uh just disappear uh as their visas are, or as they're deported, or their their, you know, their visas aren't renewed, or whatever. There's you know a maze on screen that the the character has to climb for with through, which represents the maze of bureaucracy. So yes, there are fantasy bits, but they all seem very rationally connected to the point. Um, yeah, the, the the magic realist. Uh thing going on there with uh you know flight of fancy tied to the immediate experience so yeah you know it uh, certainly I, i'd say it, uh, it looks uh enjoyable uh but yes i agree yeah certainly didn't scream terribly weird to me but uh, as always fingers crossed i agree and uh tilda swinton uh is of course maybe the not most notable thing about it and i thought what was interesting to me watching watching the trailer um she she wears this uh you know kind of um uh, uh, unnatural red colored wig or dyed hair and didn't look like tilda swinton at all and didn't really sound like tilda swinton at all and i thought you know gosh any actress of a certain age could be playing this role but i i bet i bet she's gonna kill it yeah. Oh, I bet she can't do anything but help to kill it. <laughs> so that's Problemista from A24, getting the widest release of anything of our three movies uh, that are out there. This next one probably is the second widest release. I'm not sure. The other two are probably both of them not getting quite as large a release <laughs> uh, however, we're going to let Giles describe uh, what he sees on the screen here. Okay. This this is a, a shot on what's very obviously a TV set talk show, most likely. The whole rainbow of brown is on display here with delightful curving lines creating uh, delicate arcs of different sort of mud to orange to crimson so that's our that's our backdrop and in the foreground there is a rather distressed looking older girl or younger woman i guess she's probably around 15 or 16 seated in a green chair wearing a sort of overall uh dress thing white stockings floral print shirt, semi-straggly brown hair, and uh, of note is she is uh, restrained as she is seated in this chair to be held in place for a uh, future trouble, case of future trouble, no doubt. And looking upon her immediately to the right as we look at this is a well-coiffed, sideburned, black-haired gentleman in a uh, lighter brown suit with a rainbow of khaki tie on and he is looking on this young woman or older girl with a 
modest apprehension and kneeling just before the girl to the uh, left of the gentleman in the foreground is a uh, very um, well, that's the word I'm looking for, well put together, good outfit, a nice deep burgundy, also floral print on the uh, blouse shirt, uh, lovely locks of hair with a look of uh, disimpassioned concern. And looming in the background are a couple of guys, one with a mustache, one with a goatee. Goatee man is wearing, looks like a nice, mm, burgundy velour jacket. So this is very much a period scene here on this television set of Tasty Browns. And this is a still from a movie that... Uh, well, well, let me guess. If See, if this was actually the game, I would have broken in and guessed it long ago because this is very clearly from Late Night with the Devil. That's right. I had the pleasure of seeing this uh, at Fantasia this past summer. A uh, full house in the bigger of the two theaters, lively crowd, a whole lot of fun. Possibly my favorite found footage style horror thing. It's done in the uh, as if it were a live TV show from 1977 when Halloween fell during sweeps week. And the host here is uh, trying to boost his show's ratings. And uh, to do that, he's pulling out slightly more stops than might be advised right so it's um as i you've seen it i haven't so as as i understand it's like a halloween night uh, broadcast on this late night tv show from the 70s and it looks like uh to me just going off the trailer and probably just going off this still we're looking at right here it's uh the exorcist meets the merv griffin show <laughs> yeah that's uh it's better than another comparison i think they had in the trailer which was uh, rosemary's baby meets network which is you know not the worst comparison but your, yours is i'd say superior uh there are definitely comedy moments in this thing definitely a lot of great uh old style horror i believe most of the effects are uh practical and it's uh just uh, was a delight to watch. And also, you know, it was fair weather when we went into the theater. And uh, when we left after the screening, there was some really weird, turbulent thunder, crackle, rain, and lightning, which was a nice uh, coincidental effect that uh, wrapped up the entire evening quite well for me. And it stars uh, a guy whose name I'm probably going to massacre, David Dastmalshian. I think that's actually... Yeah, pretty close from yeah, I don't quite know myself, but I have heard it pronounced that way by other people. So and yeah, he's uh he looks like a good guy to watch. Uh he played the older brother in Relaxer, is uh, how I primarily knew him before. And he's that's been right. in a bunch of stuff. But, but that's is, what I was gonna say. He's he's like the first character from a Joel Petrikas film. Now, if you don't know Joel Petrikas, Joel Petrikas, of course, makes movies for about uh, thirty thousand yeah. dollars so obviously <laughs> the uh actors don't get paid much but he's the first one that seems to who's appeared in a Protrichus movie that seems to be getting a real career going yeah and this very this is... different in this than he was in relaxer he looks oh yes he looks he's... like an adult whereas relaxer he was basically an overgrown adolescent yeah, and uh, he, he's charismatic in this one as opposed to just uh, distilled jerk. Yeah, in relaxer. So Giles says this is weird. So we're we're going off Giles's recommendation. Yeah, it's oh. it's weird enough. Uh, I suspect uh, when others view it, they will be less enthusiastic. But uh, if I make any errors at three six six, they are on the side of enthusiasm, which uh, is better than some. I think it, I think at the very least it's a, a good horror going to be a good yeah. horror movie because all the reviews have been pretty positive and it is it's from uh, IFC uh, being released by I should say IFC who's had a good record with horror movies of late um, they did uh, Where Evil Lurks mm. last year they released that which is a really fine if not terribly weird horror movie that uh from from um 
well, I think it was from Brazil. It's from a South American country, probably Brazil, uh, that uh, everybody should see about the uh, sort of demonic possession that's sort of also a folk horror in uh, in the local local folklore. Um, but that's uh, Late Night with the Devil. So let's move on to the next one, which Giles will describe this poster. All right. We have, uh, I don't know if any of you are familiar with hmm, 1970s uh, animated fantasy fonts and motifs, but <laughs> this uh, certainly is riding that hard, especially the font of the title. But moving just above that title, we have a washed out, uh, over light saturated image of four ne'er do well looking kids. Looks like they got uh, three of them are on little, you know, uh, little motorbike kind of little things you know small small ones like that uh, the three on the bikes they're armed with uh, what i happen to know are uh paintball guns which uh, augurs uh maybe menace at best certainly not any deadliness unless you get an unlucky shot and the three on the bikes they're looking real kind of mad max they're gonna take care of stuff but seated between the uh, two closer bikes is a young girl in a summery kind of dress with a summery long kind of hairstyle, wearing sandals, looking a little out of place, but simultaneously in charge. And all this is uh, sort of superimposed on a deep background of a generic kind of lightly flowing hilly landscape that is also a bit of an oversaturated uh, kind of, uh, oh, what's the word I'm looking for, processing done to it. And flanking the title and continuing the 70s fantasy animated poster motif are jets of pink and ochre and, you know, some orangey kind of flame with a hand on either side, one holding a mushroom, the other holding a frog. So a lot of uh, fantasy and supernatural uh, kind of little touches um, on this otherwise perhaps gritty looking uh, item here. And it looks like, okay, and it seems that a bunch of people are named in very tiny font, uh, just above or below little splats of uh, yellow. So this is, okay, so we have a description, the Neo fairy tale film. We have a location, Ribbon, Wyoming, and then the names of the four. I'd like to log in and uh, I'd like to guess the name. Please, yes. A riddle of fire that's right riddle of fire fairy tale adventure coming out now i think yes yes that's why we're featuring it yeah hey that'll, that'll explain it uh yeah i saw the trailer and uh yeah it's got it's got a quest it's got uh, some sort of uh mysticism it has an ogre character and uh so this looked uh well cute so, and dark a couple of things i would point out uh one despite it being a kids movie uh there's there's that very strong witchcraft uh motif right with the the toad and the toad stool which is actually a uh and uh not just any old mushroom it's a no. amanita mushroom which is uh hallucinogenic yep the classic uh, red with a white spot thing going yeah. on and was also associated with uh witchcraft uh i noticed that in a lot of old like slavic paintings and things you'll find amanita's oh, uh, okay. something occult they'll uh they will just throw a couple of amanita's in there for you to look at um, so yeah, let's um, go describe the trailer, what you saw in the trailer, if you want uh, uh, there, Giles. Oh, yeah. Well, uh, similarly to the... Um, I think you might have done it. Yeah, all. filmic saturation. It uh, definitely is set up to look like a bit of a period piece from, uh, yeah, I'm going to say 1970s or 60s. Uh, the trailer certainly didn't have any obvious... Uh, shall we say, contemporary technology. And it looks like uh, capering of these uh, bored, I presume, youths uh, with the young girl 
uh, who is uh, doubtless the protagonist, um, seems to have a sickly or otherwise adversely afflicted mother uh, for whom she needs to make a special pie which requires special speckled eggs, the last box of which at the store are taken by um, some sort of cowboy, ponytailed, rough guy, jerk fellow who uh, becomes what... Uh, becomes the antagonist from all signs in the uh, trailer itself. Um, I was wondering from the trailer if it was kind of a uh, less less dark Tideland scenario because it yeah, looked like her was... mother might have been uh, using uh, some illicit substances and that might have been her problem that the girl was trying yes. to... Yes, uh, I was... Yeah, I, I also got a um, softer Tideland vibe from the trailer there. Yeah, and so it's a lot of, you know, it's clearly seen through the eyes of a child and a lot of uh, fantasy uh, imagination stuff. I think what brought it to my notice was when it screened at TIFF, the programmer was uh, maybe a little hyperbolic uh, with it, but I hope not because they described it as if I may quote, a neo fairy tale that evokes the sensation of turn tuning into a late night broadcast of an obscure and wackadoo children's film from another dimension. And that is something that description really whets our appetite. So yeah. I hope it can live up to that. And my, my thought is uh, the, the specific um, comparison there makes me wonder that, well, it makes me inclined to think that this person has experienced that in their own childhood and are speaking from this experience to describe this uh, more contemporary uh, phenomenon here. So, yeah, I, I'm, I am intrigued myself. Oh, and another thing that's interesting uh, about this is it's the first theatrical release of a new film uh, from uh, a pair of partners, interesting partners, Yellow Veil Pictures, who are usually known for their uh, Blu-rays and uh, UHDs of classic, uh, you know, French cinema. They did do um, uh, a recent one from Gaspar Noé, um, whose name escapes me. Giles, the one with the, all the strobe lighting that was a short... Um, oh, uh, 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 Fluxiturna? Fluxiturna, like yeah, which did make it into theaters, but not on this kind of level. And they're partnering with Vinegar Syndrome, uh, oh, who, to oh. my knowledge, has never actually done anything with a new movie. Now, they have done restorations of things that have, have played of older movies and often movies that they've rediscovered that have played theaters. But for both these players, I believe it's their first time getting into a... Uh, movie that is just a flat out new movie made this yeah. year. Yeah, well, yeah, since we've got a moment, uh, I've got their uh, sales store front, sh shop front up here, and uh, seeing a bunch of titles that I'm familiar with. They are, re they released Relaxer, they released Luz, Starfish, they released. Uh, Let's see, Stanleyville. Which one, Yellow Veil or? Yeah, this is Yellow Veil. So, uh, so yeah, some of those are, you're, okay. Some of those are, I was wrong. Those are, there, there are a lot of newer ones there. But uh, certainly ones that we have been at least given reason to cover. And they also release uh, a lot of older ones. But uh, yeah. I, yeah, I guess I didn't do my uh, research. Yellow. Uh, I only did it just now. So don't. <laughs> <laughs> Yellow. Pretty sure I'm correct on Vinegar Syndrome, but I'll probably be proven wrong there too. They probably release new movies as well. Um, but anyway, I thought that was a very interesting pairing because we're, we've been interested in just about anything that Yellow Veil uh, releases. And yeah. Um, Similar to uh, Vinegar Syndrome, uh, not as much interested in everything, but they have a very high batting average with us. And yeah. Vinegar Syndrome uh, released um, uh, some um, quite a few. Movies. Oh yeah, Vinegar, yeah. They well, they uh, they seem to they they definitely have a horror focus, but that does uh, 
have a lot of overlap with the genre cinema thing that uh, tilts more toward our. our Liquid cover. Sky, for example, they really yeah. are. Yeah, uh, I definitely have a few eventually released. Really. Yeah. Obviously not originally, but uh, in the, it was a really nice addition. Yeah, that's for sure. Yeah, they they have a very high batting average uh, for us. They also do a lot of genre cin cinema. And for some reason, uh, Golden Age of Porn is the other thing they release. <laughs> yeah, time. I think I, uh, looking at their website over the years, and I could be mistaken because I haven't uh, been keeping too close tabs on this. I think they've slowly been moving away from that. I, they still do the occasional release, I've noticed, but it seems they do a lot of other stuff now i yeah i think that's how they got their start uh is a mix of golden age of, of porn and like really obscure genre grindhouse films yeah. and now they have expanded into a lot more uh, artistic and interesting avenues not that those you know aren't interesting on their own and sometimes but, artistic yeah and very very like uh, opening of misty beethoven which has been a topic of discussion for some <laughs> Uh, mm. on uh, <laughs> on our website um but that's riddle of fire so uh let's move on to the very last one giles describe it if you will all right we are seated in a theater audience it's empty we see the rows of chairs in front of us flanking each side of the stage proper are uh light gold painted walls with I'm going to say Pegasus rampant in a uh, done up in a 3D pop out style. But of course, the main thing to look at here is the stage on which there is a velvet curtain. The show not having started yet, it is flanked by walls with crests and there's the arch above it with a crest. And emerging from this unopened velvet curtain is a green mist that has just begun to escape into the auditorium. All right, I, I would like to guess uh, Lynch Oz. That's right. All right. Is, uh, take it this is a still from Lynch Oz or is this a yes. very bold cover that has no title on it? It is a still, yes. Uh, um, and uh, well, so Lynch Oz is out on Blu-ray. It had been out on VOD uh, where I saw it. The only real extra on the Blu-ray is the supplemental interview with the director, who was really um, more of an editor and cat herder on this movie, because the format here is that he has six uh, people, um, five filmmakers, well, actually one of them or two of them share one, but anyway, six segments, five filmmakers and one film critic who discussed the connection between David Lynch and uh, The Wizard of Oz. And that might not sound like it would take up a full 90 minutes, um, uh, but it's really just a jumping off point for them to talk about uh, both films and to make sort of intertextual comments about uh, cinema going back and forth. And, it, you know, they come up with one thing that leads them to a thought about another thing and so on. And um, the cross-fertilization between David Lynch and Wizard of Oz uh, is there. Obviously, uh, Wild at Heart, I think everybody oh. knows very heavily references the Wizard of Oz. A lot of the references may be um, a lot more subtle, but as I say, it's really just a jumping point for them to talk about uh, both films. And I thought the first uh, segment titled The Wind by uh, Amy Nicholson was the best. She is a film critic, uh, not a uh, filmmaker. And I, I thought that was notable that maybe it's because of her facility with the written word that she gets uh, the best segment and the first segment in uh, instead of the filmmakers. Uh, but I, I thought it was hey one win, one for one win for critics against filmmakers. Yeah. The yeah. other notable interview is they're all good and it's very much worth a watch and uh, pretty much must watch for fans of David Lynch. But the other kind of notable thing is John Waters on there and his 
segment is very different than anybody else's. He he doesn't uh, do film analysis. He just tells stories, tells stories about when he met uh, David Lynch, tells stories about uh, the only time apparently he ever dressed in drag in his life was to uh, as uh, the Wicked Witch of the West. Um, so that's uh, mm -hmm. he, very entertaining stories, and they sort of break up the uh, the more analytical segments from the other five uh, highlighted individuals. And I, I presume that Justin Benson and Aaron Moorhead speak together, as they uh... yeah they I, I they trade off I think I think they trade off I'm not I wasn't always sure which one of them was speaking. Mm -hmm. uh, so yes, but Justin uh, uh, Benson and Aaron Moorhead go to do a segment together. Uh, Giles, any thoughts about? Uh... No, uh, no, no. I, I've I've read the review and watched the trailer, and uh, I, I, as someone who uh, likes a fair amount of David Lynch and indeed uh, admires his skill, I am. Possibly the least of the Lynch fans, at least working at 366, um, for my various reasons, which I won't go into right now. But uh, so, but this this looks fascinating, and you know, I, I do like to hear uh, critics and filmmakers talking about movies, so it uh, certainly holds enough interest for me that if they I talk, ever don't have to pay for it, I might watch it. They talk about a lot more than uh, yeah. just Lynch and Wizard of Oz, too. There are. At the end credits, there are probably a hundred films that they take clips from huh. uh, yeah. because yeah, they, yeah. Discuss, they discuss the influence of um, other films on David Lynch and the influence mm -hmm. of The Wizard of Oz on other films. And so, I mean, it was that's why the director's work, I said, was more like an editor because he had to go search out all these clips to illustrate the <laughs> essays with. And uh, and like I said, there were probably a hundred of them. Oh, and, and you know, getting rights to things can be a very uh, trying ordeal. All right. So uh, that should do it for today's weird movie roundup. And we will be back uh, very soon, hopefully, with uh, actually for you, that should be instantaneous with a, uh, a weird movie quiz show. Rock and roll. We're hoping will be enjoyable. You can certainly play along just as you would with Jeopardy or any other Wheel of Fortune. Or We don't have any theme music. but uh, So we're leaving right now and see you very soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Good afternoon, fans, and welcome to today's episode of Guess That Weird Movie. The rules are simple. I will describe the poster image of a famous weird movie and our contestants will buzz in to attempt to name the film in question. Each correct answer gets a point, and the contestant with the most points at the finish, either after our 20 images have been described or we run out of time, wins. I will describe the image, and once the title is guessed, or not, I will share it. Let's now go around the screen and meet the contestants, starting with Ms. McSorley. Hi. Terry here. I'm a big horror movie fan and I had a blog, Gore Girls Dungeon, for a long time. It hasn't been active, but I am active on the Twitter and uh, newly on TikTok and uh, just a movie fan. Happy to be here. Wonderful. Mr. Hubbard? Uh, well, those, those who have tuned in, my name is Robert Hubbard or L. Rob Hubbard, as you can see on the site. Uh, I write uh, uh, for 366 Weird Movies uh, for for a while. Um, I also have my own blog, uh, Mimazine, which uh, you can find. Which you can find. I occasionally blog there. Uh, most of the time, I'm dropping little nuggets of wisdom on Facebook and Twitter on occasion. Excellent. And finally, the administrator. Hi, I'm Greg Smalley. I'm a weird movie reviewer from Louisville, Kentucky, and my hobbies include liking and subscribing to Pod 366 and watching weird movies.
That is fantastic. All right. So without further ado, we're going to get this started. Uh, contestants, please buzz to indicate your buzzer is functional. Baby. <laughs> Good. Good. Good enough. All right. We're going to start with an easy. This wasn't problem. in the rules that we were going to have to like provide our own sound effects. <laughs> but. Take all your qu questions up with the administrator after the contest. He'll be happy to address them. All right, here we go. This is all on black, deep black. I'm going to talk about the font a little bit. It's close to cadmium red. It's dripping. It's gory. It's scary. Dominating. Suspiria. <laughs> Suspiria. <laughs> I'm sorry that's not it. You are uh, disqualified unless both Greg and Rob fail to guess. I will continue with the description. Dominating the top half of this poster is a pair of lips. Uh, baby, uh, Rocky Horror Picture Show. That's correct, Greg, the Rocky <laughs> Horror Picture Show. Now oh, it started so early. I really jumped the gun there. <laughs> and as you can see here, there oh, is I can see the Rocky <laughs> Picture <laughs> Show. A different set of jaws, oh, yeah. <laughs> which is uh, definitely, this is a period poster I found for it. And uh, I guess there was some competition that year from a lesser film. Uh, All Josh right. Giles, are you aware that we can see the upcoming? I, I am, and I can split this into 20 different things or, uh, well. I mean, I didn't really uh, get any of them but uh good good well what i'll do then is this i can i can fix this easily i'll have that as my own uh, reference point so we'll go into the next image which i believe you can't see since i'm no longer sharing and i will prep okay. my my own little thing here so that we don't give any further sneak peeks all right this next picture here we have got a lineup of four Famous comedy actors, one of them looking dismayed in a pale suit, one of them looking evil with a strange nose, bow tie and receding white hairline, one of them looking a bit smarmy with a sheriff's badge, and on the far right, the one woman in the film wearing a dress with one of the blankest stares I've ever seen. These four figures are looming over a junkyard motif. On the right-hand side, there is a tall mansion with a clock tower atop it. On the left-hand side is a buzzard sitting atop a pile of bones and scattered around are various uh, wrecked vehicles. Bat. What's your guess? Uh, I just saw this, like, Last month, uh, nothing but trouble. That is correct. Nothing but Ooh, trouble. Yes. Wonderful. One of Pete Turbovich's favorites and one of the only movies we, we reviewed three times, having once said, <laughs> no, we're not going to do it. And then, oh, we went and did it anyway. Very nicely done. And of course, the image for that one here, I'll bring up on... Um, Oh, we'll let's see if I can quickly open that. This is obviously not going to work in my favor, so I'm going to have to start winging it. Here we go. The image in question is, of course, for nothing but trouble. And as you can see when I share my screen here, look at that. There's Chevy Chase, Dan Aykroyd, John Candy, Demi Moore, and... <laughs> <laughs> You've already guessed it, Rob. Ah, okay. Yes, yes. Oh, you, okay. Yeah, we're we're doing we're doing an on the fly rejig here. So that was nothing but trouble. <laughs> Dead heat between Greg and Rob, and we begin round three. It is definitely not over yet for Ms. McSorley. So we're gonna dive to something a little more <laughs> uh weird here. This film is uh, got a future look there is a man looking apprehensively toward the camera taking this snapshot if you will he is at the end of a short tunnel that is absolutely glowing with neon style or fluorescent tube lighting he has a grid lattice superimposed on his face, which is, uh, shall we say, a bit of foreshadowing for this uh, minor character that leaves a major impression at the beginning of this film. He is looming, as I said, at the end of a tunnel. Baby. I'm going to point out it's a square tunnel. Baby. Yes. Cube? 
That is cute. Congratulations, <laughs> Greg. That is this thing with, of course, okay. the, the guy on the box, I think, lives for all of 15 seconds. <laughs> or, well, things happen to him. All right. Nicely done. I'm going to stop mm -hmm. the share, close that file, and randomly choose. Oh, here we go. This will be an inch. This will be a fun one. We have a different color tone here. This one is a white one. And dominating this uh, movie poster is a kind of jaunty cowboy style formal attire guy. Some style and shades, a Stetson cap, bolo tie. Cut off mostly, but you can see that there's a guitar to this gentleman's right, and he is reading a tabloid newspaper, which is advertising uh, not only the name of the film, but uh, the ostensible subject matter of this film. Maybe. Rob, did you get in? No, so I'm still... Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. I guess that's you, Gray. Uh, it's... Uh, uh... True stories. That's correct, Greg. <laughs> oh, oh, okay. You're owning it here and uh, sharing my screen now. We've got there he is, okay. Dave Byrne, reading about his own movie. What a poser! <laughs> All right, as we shuffle forward through this extravaganza, we're going to reach a little bit further back in history, and we're going to go straight to, oh, we'll go for a deep dive here. I have a terrible suspicion Greg may be dominating, but we got some horror going on, not to give too much away. All yeah. right, this film poster is on a an orange seeping into reddish backdrop. Dominating the upper half is a very elaborate photo frame and inside a sepia photograph of two individuals, each looking kind of distressed in their own way. L dripping from this frame is blood, very 70s paint style blood oozing down as we read the names of the two uh, stars. Hubbard. Uh, don't look now. That is correct. Okay. L. Rob Hubbard has nailed it here, and I will show everyone this vintage poster of Don't Look Now, yeah. advising that we pass the warning, which I'm sure is generally good advice, but uh, I don't remember its pertinence in the film. Mm -hmm. All right. Stopping the share there, and we're going to move to... Oh, here we go. We'll go a little bit into the stranger kind of image here. This is a, you may not be familiar with this, but we'll see. Green lighting throughout. In the center of this poster is a girl, perhaps a young woman, facing to the left as we look upon her, hands neatly folded on her lap, and what's more interesting than her, by a long shot, are the many things going on in this image. There are snails covering the entire framework for the poster. There are snails scattered about within it. There are spirally motifs to be found uh, over the walls and uh, intruding into random spots. There is a dark shape in the right hand side with even more spiraling things coming from the cobwebs in the upper hand corner are some snails looking out on some more spirals with let, oh, oh. let rob rob was in first rob. is it spiral by chance Japanese i'm gonna spiral? accept that uh oh who's um <laughs> Oh, I'm going to mangle the Japanese Uzuma Uzumaki. That is definitely close okay. enough. Uzumaki is probably <laughs> as well as I could hope to do myself. This uh, is a, a poster I had never seen before oh, uh, yeah. about five mm -hmm. hours ago when I assembled this bunch of stills. <laughs> and so that is how that was uh, advertised in Japan originally. So that was Uzumaki, also known as, with, well, which means spiral. All right, we will shuffle forward to a, a long classic here. This is, all right, this is an older movie poster. 
This is a nighttime sky. The moon dominates the left-hand half. This is placed laterally. And in that moon, there is a man with a shock of black hair holding a woman in an embrace in one hand. And just below his embracing hand, he is holding a knife, a knife which he makes considerable use of throughout the picture in question. This giant moon looms over a small farmstead by a pond. And in the right hand side, Almost as an afterthought from the poster designer, I guess, is the uh, inked portrait of a young boy who is one of the actual protagonists in this particular motion picture. As uh, none of you have buzzed in yet, I will go on to explain that on the hands of this embracer with the knife are uh, some tattoos spelling out two different words. Yeah. Maybe. Is it, is it really Knight of the Hunter? It is really Night oh. of the Hunter coming in hot from, I don't know what, 70 yeah. years ago. Robert Mitchum and, uh, you know, the other people. Shelley Winters, of course, and whoever that kid is. I don't think he even gets named. Uh, maybe he's one of the <laughs> small names there. But yeah, I, I, I just quite like how the main character got such short shrift in his uh in his movie poster there as interesting as, i've i've know, never seen hero. i've never seen this particular artwork for night wow. there were a number to choose from uh for sourcing all of these i i did my best to find the original movie poster but of course in this era there there were plenty of different you mm -hmm. know options to choose from since it was not so uh homogenized back in the day mm -hmm. but that I, is a I a period never. poster Never would have got it without the tattoos, but I, the mm, tattoos, that was it. I, I don't blame you. I, I don't think it goes. That could probably describe <laughs> yeah. uh, half of the film noir-esque or otherwise uh, black and white thriller kind of movies from that era with its uh, dominant moon there. All right. Well, let's shuffle around in time. Oh, here's a fun one. Okay. We are now... We are in the 90s now with a dark, up-close, mm. black-and-white photograph of a, of a gentleman. It's hard to see much about him other than that he is bald-headed, but by the time we might investigate any details, his face kind of melds into the face of the lead actress in this film and just kind of shuffled off to the side is a third character who I don't think really quite deserves the uh, billing here that his screen time might suggest, but he was a very big name in that era. The font is uh, kind of a jagged street, very clear to read, but, you know, almost like it's been graffitied. It's another one of those great cadmium colors that uh, you find in a you know, those uh, fun time thriller-esque sorts of things. And dominating the eye socket of the foreground individual, this being the one, uh, the, the hairless uh, fellow who is dominating the frame, is a glowing circle inside of which is a almost feral looking animal. And all of this being probably no larger than a quarter on a life-size poster for this particular motion picture. <laughs> Do we have any guesses, or am I going to have to start making more stuff up? <laughs> well, Nine, 90s, you said? Hmm. Apparently guessing posters not really my thing. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, okay, uh, maybe expanding no. a little on this. Uh, all right, we can see the rough, almost prisonly shirt collar of the uh, dominant figure in the for dominant head figure in the foreground and the almost forgotten but more you know, you know somewhere around tertiary character has a goatee ill-kept beard kind of thing going on reflecting the mental state perhaps of the character in question i'll try angel heart <laughs> angel heart i'll have to check that out do you uh that is incorrect uh as <laughs> and in three <laughs> In two, in one. All right. Well, that's a point against me anyway. So we're going to share the screen. And here is ah! oh. 12 ah. movies. Okay. Which uh, 
was I think uh, toward the beginning of that awful trend of just jamming every single character onto uh, an image they possibly could. So that was, all right, one point against the presenter. Let's see, we're going to go for, oh, here we go. We're going to go to foreign lands now. And we have here, oh, it is a formally glorious wall with a door, nice hard wood, probably painted a delightful suede beige when it was new, but it's now all dowdy and moldy and unpleasant. And in this wall is a door, as I said, and this door is open and peering through this door is a young girl with golden hair and a look of fearlessness on her face. Uh, baby, is it uh, a Spunk Myers Alice? That is uh. correct. It is the uh, most consistent poster for Swamp Myers, Alice, I could find. This okay. uh, image that I yeah. recall on the VHS copy from uh, East Side Video, which yeah. has not existed now for, I think, 30 years or so. But uh, they had this, among other other delights. And so that is Swamp Myers. So that is another point for Greg and we are just about halfway through the images I have selected. All right, we are going, I'm going to quickly take a peek here. <laughs> no, I, I was told uh, sh uh, a little too late for my compilation, uh, Terry, that uh, you're a horror person, which I remembered <laughs> when I was advised that. So I'm thinking if we do this again and if you're sporting enough to join us, I'm going to stick with 366, but uh, more toward uh, that angle because, you know, everyone has their forte and <laughs> Greg obviously has the home home ground advantage this big. Yes, horror is <laughs> definitely my favorite, but I mean, I do watch other movies. I have probably oh. seen all these movies that you've talked about, but yeah, I guess I didn't know the poster, so. <laughs> it, uh, well, as, as I said, many of these I didn't either uh, until my... I'd like uh, to point out that Terry has a uh, horror movie right over her left shoulder, The Karate Kid. <laughs> that's, a menacing that's tale. An action figure. That's a Johnny Lawrence action figure, actually. Oh <laughs> yeah, he has three different heads, an angry head, a happy head. Quite fantastic. <laughs> yeah, that's fantastic. Wonderful. <laughs> All right, this one is going to be a bit difficult for me. There's a lot going on in this. It's black and white. It is almost done like a photograph, but in like a, a drawn version of a photograph. And dominating the middle of this has got to be some of the most expressively terrified eyebrows I've ever seen on a woman or anyone at all in a <laughs> horror movie poster. This is black and white, mind you. She's got tousled, uh, longish brown hair. She's wearing, I'm going to guess, a white dress. Hard to tell from the color, uh, the coloring here since this is a, a vintage poster once again. And she is being clutched, oh, I can't say reassuringly, but almost menacingly, either for her or for the both of her and the man clutching her, is a very fervent, eyeballed fellow with sideburns, black hair, thick black mustache. And in the background, we can see the silhouettes of perhaps more peaceable times in their relationship together, of him looking kind of upward at a a wispy version of the uh, heroine or victim, certainly the female protagonist in question. The only, uh, there is some non-black and white here, and that's in the um, title that is done in a bold capital letter, po three-dimensional, and it ends with an exclamation mark. Now, any uh, further thoughts on this? Um, well, there's a lot of text littered around, which I can't read to you, but, uh, this, this movie is, uh, one is a film that I wasn't even really aware of until today. Uh, it's from the mid seventies and there's a lot of fear and angst going on. <sighs> and I will blame none of you now that I'm looking at this again, if you don't get it. <laughs> mm. All right. Three, 
two, got one. All right. Well, I can, I guess, perhaps blame one of you. Uh, and I'm sure you'll own up the moment I share this because uh, one of you okay. reviewed this. <laughs> oh, yes. Uh, I've actually seen this. Okay. Movie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, I love the, well, I I love trying the to, well, it's interesting trying to match your just trying to match the descriptions uh, also with my memory of like of like movie and poster art. And it's like. This uh, was another one with, uh, shall we say, more than one option for it. This was the most uh, striking. And uh, I don't and <laughs> I think maybe if I could have more fully communicated the eyebrow thing, perhaps that might have jogged your memory because yeah. that that picture <laughs> of the top of her head is just, I've never seen anything quite like it. <laughs> that was Thundercrack. I don't think you said what it was. Oh, sorry, excuse me. Yes, that was Thundercrack. Uh, that is a canon film reviewed. Uh, of course, yeah, Rob, you're reaching, you'd be reaching back seven or eight years now. Uh, that was canonically weird, number 275 in the <laughs> ease of war all right well we'll go to something with some color now more more color than yellow all right this this is great we got a cloudy dark green thing going on here we've got a bold angular super sci-fi font for this uh well it's not quite a palindromic title but it definitely uh, has some some uh, echoes from first half to second and in this poster dominating much of the image is an unfurled hand reaching out to the observer of this particular picture and standing on this hand is a gentleman baby wearing very... Sorry. Is, it, yes. uh, <laughs> is it phantasm no it is not phantasm oh. greg you're out unless the other two are unable to make a guess Anyhow, in this hand is a gentleman standing. He is wearing very tall black boots. He is a mustachioed fellow with a sort of ponytail length black hair. And he himself is holding out his own hand, creating a blast of light image, almost crystalline in its uh, motif. Lots of jagged points coming out. And that is projecting an image of a bund woman with a low cut decolletage of a blue dress. And then to the right of her, this is small, mind you, coming from the hand from the hand that is uh, on display here, is a swarthy fellow holding what might be a corpse, certainly a limp, very pale body. And to the right <laughs> of that man is another woman dressed with, similarly to the woman on the left. Can't tell her hair because she's got uh, it done up in a in a fetching green and red uh, cloth thing going on it. And this is all hovering above glasses of red wine. This is only one part of this image. On the right hand side, not coming from any hands whatsoever, is a sort of aquatic thing which has some crucified Jesus things going on amongst some swimmers. And in the middle of this thing, there looks like a battlefield with a fellow in armor on horseback, various corpses littering the field. Looks like someone's holding a gun to another. And seeing as the other two haven't buzzed in yet, other than the hand and the man on the hand dominating this is a giant, giant stone carved face. Ah, ah, in a, oh. ah. Zardoz. It is Zardoz. Okay. That is correct. I knew it was, there was something, it was familiar. I was going to keep myself to make that, too, but okay. So, perhaps one of my favorite it. movie posters I've seen when hunting around. Wow, yeah. A lot of great stuff going on. That is and, pretty uh, great. And I <laughs> I think that leaves the score four to four to uh, Ms. McSorley. <laughs> yes. And uh, we, oh. <laughs> we have eight minutes left, so I will uh, I will shuffle along as, as best I can. Let's see. Oh, here's another famous one. This will be this will be quick. I'm sure. We are moving now into the future. Not as far future as Zardoz's set, of course, because we're not there yet. We have a very uh, tight font here over orange. We have a very beigey, bland background above a man holding an item in his hands. And above this item is a fedora hat. There is... To describe this item, well... I'm going to guess it's a Clark Nova, but it is some oh, sort of... Uh, okay. 
Uh, I think that was I think that was Greg. Yeah. Naked lunch. That's right. It is naked lunch with the famous typewriter uh, man. Well, almost photograph looking, but obviously not not real there. All right, Greg has snuck ahead of Rob, and I need to start remembering which of these. Ah, here we go. All right, we're going to go back in time, but to the future once again. This is another film. This film is from the 70s, so I'll, I'll lay that out for you. It begins by advising us what year this movie takes place. This advisement... Babe, this, does it... I'm going to guess. Uh, uh -oh. yeah, yes. Uh, uh, boy and his dog. Greg. Man, <laughs> okay. You are killing us. Yeah. There it is. Yep. And uh, I do, I do quite enjoy the fact that we are living this future yeah. now, because it is 2024, and as we can see all around us, it's just a, a Mad Max style hellscape with uh, freaks. And... It's coming very right. soon. Well, well, and and I actually do live in Topeka, so oh, it, so you you see this more than the rest of us i'm guessing oh yeah, this is pretty much <laughs> prophecy <laughs> well it uh that was that was pinned by uh oh gosh but ellison right harlan yeah the oh, short story yeah the short story by ellison although by I, as ellison. with most things he hated it because that that was sort of the thing he did was hate stuff so uh well, yeah. said love so with Ellison, kind of like love. It's kind of love and hate. It's kind of a love hate mm. thing, depending on things. So, so I think he ended up like uh, loving this. I, I guess of all the adaptations of his, okay, uh, of his work, liked I, it better than the Oscar. So, huh? I think it's uh, he loves to hate things. Mm. Well, I, I can only hope so. Otherwise, he wouldn't have been terribly. Well, I'm sure. He, anyway, moving on from an author I know virtually nothing about. We'll go to a movie poster that uh, I remember fairly well from the uh, late 90s. This is uh, on black. There's an outline of a, of a head. Then, and this head is made up of a sort of mud-looking blue-toned substance. And in the center of this head is a small door. This door has been opened outward toward us. And what we see is an office backdrop. Ah. Oh, oh me, me, I got that first. <laughs> is it being John Malkovich? <laughs> it is being John Malkovich. <laughs> there it is. Terry diving in. Wonderful. That was finally like... got one. <laughs> <laughs> Nicely done. Being nice. John Malkovich is correct. So we will now quickly shuffle, not to rob you of time for your little victory there, but uh, <laughs> we are down to the last four minutes. And I got to see. All right. Well, let's see if I can do this one with any degree of clarity. All right. This really looks like it's from the 70s, but golly, it sure isn't. There is a massive volcano dominating the right-hand side. In front of this volcano is a gentleman with his arms raised in quiet, well, or probably loud awe. We see the back of his head and uh, whatever uh, mysticism baby. he may be mumbling. Oh, Greg, are you ready already? I'm ready already. All right, Greg, what, what do you think it is? <laughs> is this... Uh... The Forbidden Room. Oh, it is the Forbidden Room, as everyone knows, of course, the Volcano movie. As uh, you know, yeah. it was advertised as. I actually knew that one. <laughs> I didn't get it before Excellent. for Gregory there, but uh, <laughs> I knew it. All right, that was I love the that movie. <laughs> so what haven't I done? I, I that was my that is act that image is actually my. Uh, uh, desktop background as we speak. Oh, the, uh, wow. <laughs> not the movie poster, but that image. <laughs> well, I suppose. All right. Well, that, that that's all right then. Fine, fine. All right. We are getting down, I think, to the last two. I'm going to do one more poster and then I'm going to have a bonus one because I'll be describing a still. And we will have this last poster. Oh, let's have it be this one. This is a nice one. This is a foreign film. This is a foreign film from, I think it was the 70s it came out, but don't quote me. Blue Tones, Starscape, 
white etched pencil drawing of what looks like a combination of silo and well and rocket ship floating together to the left of a fellow done up in, uh, shall we say, very high 17th or early 18th century military fashion, bewigged with, you know, those uh, classy little curled side things that men used to go around in all the time. Wonderful academic beard, goatee mustache, holding a saber that he is resting on as he observes what appears to be uh, a quaint landscape to him, but as uh, we might guess, some exotic extraterrestrial area. Uh, b baby, I, this isn't right, but is it the Saragossa manuscript? It is not the Saragossa manuscript. He is smoking a pipe in this picture, and from this pipe, well, I thought for a moment there might be an image, but no, it's just a curl of smoke as he looks upon this combination silo well rocket device to his right. Uh, I know this, I know this can't be right since you're saying 70s. The only thing that's coming to my mind is Baron Munchausen, but that is correct. And is that not ah. the 70s? Uh, is that the is that the Czech film? Uh, early 60s, if it's... Oh, if it's dear. The, uh, well, Carl suppose, Zeman. Uh, another, another point against me for misleading. So I guess congratulations. Uh, 62, excuse me. I did see it recently. Mm -hmm. And uh, golly, if it didn't look, shall we say, timeless. But All right, we got less than a minute. So we're going to dive into this before we say goodbye, everybody. And thank you very kindly for listening to all this. We have one more thing. This is grainy. This is black and white. Cloaked figure holding a flower, turning to face us. There is no face on this entity that is humanoid but not quite of this earth maybe who knows maybe. it's this bright white light what, there's, there's not one for meshes of the afternoon I think. oh no there isn't but that is correct oh yeah still okay you said it was a still not a poster yes because so. there was there i i even looked for lobby cards well that is all the time we have for today terry thank you for joining us rob thank you for joining us greg thank you for hosting this event uh, next time i'm gonna see if i can whip up a nice horror focus for our horror extraordinaire and i think we are gonna be done now thank you kindly greg you're ahead with eight then rob with five and terry won the best question mm -hmm. <laughs>